everyone. What's up? It's Wednesday. It's calling the shots. I'm so excited. We got Andrew back this week. Good to be back here live. Thank you all for tuning in. Hope you guys had a good little jam session going on there with that intro music. Gets me uh, all pumped up, excited for the show. Uh, Andrew, welcome, brother. Good to see you. Happy to be back. Sorry I had to miss last week, but uh, sometimes business demands my presence there and absence here but uh very pleased to be back again yeah it was good we had a great week last week we didn't do a show <laughs> <laughs> no hey everybody always tells me how much they love calling the shots i'm already seeing it in the comments here so we certainly are glad to have you back it is uh the best show all week long now if you haven't already i'm going to tell you to download the five elements of self-defense law and there's an easy place to go do that. But before we get carried away here, it is calling the shots. And it is time to fire away. It is Alien Gear Live. We're here on Facebook. We're here on YouTube. And thank you all for being here. So happy to have you. Uh, quick reminder, go to this website right here. family uh and you're carrying a concealed weapon and um andrew I'm, again it's good to have you here for those of you that are just joining us this is andrew Braca, the man who wrote the book the law of self-defense which you should all get it's a free copy so go get it right now uh also all kinds of dvds available you can get a hat you can get a, a really cool coffee mug there's all kinds of great things on the website so go check it out lawofselfdefense.com what we're going to do today folks if you're just tuning in we have a video that we've broken down into sections and we're going to ask you this is this is where it's good to know the five elements because we're going to ask you and we're going to pause the video at a certain moment and say if they were to shoot in this moment is it a lawful shoot now the poll is going to say good shot or bad shot we know what that means maybe it's not a good idea maybe it's a bad idea to take the shot but is it lawful is really the question. Is it a lawful shot to make at this point in the video? And then we're going to pull you guys. You're going to answer that. We're going to talk about it. And we're going to continue through the video until, uh, I don't know, an act, till the hour and a half is up that we're here for the live show. Right? Absolutely. So, folks, when you see the poll, the question is, have the necessary legal conditions for the use of force been met? Would the use of force be lawful? And we're talking about deadly defensive force in this context. Uh, that's the good shoot, not shoot. Now, a completely separate question is use of force could be lawful, but maybe not a good idea or maybe not the best tactic. So we can explore that as well. But for purposes of the polling question, it's not good shoot, bad shoot, is it a good idea? It's good shoot, bad shoot, have the legal conditions been met? And of course, the legal conditions are these five elements of a claim of self-defense. So all the required elements are checked. You can get your free infographic right there at lawofselfdefense.com slash CTS. There are innocence, eminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonableness. If all the required conditions are checked, the use of defensive force is lawful. But if not, if any one of those required conditions is missing, that use of force was a criminal act. There is no legal justification, and off to jail you go. Here we go. We're just reading some comments, and I got hung up on one here. Apparently there was an active shooter. Um at the Miller Coors Brewery. Unfortunate, we we're uh, thinking about all those that were involved with that. Mm. Um, sorry, just saw that in the comments. So here's what we we're talking about. This is a perfect example. You never know what's gonna happen in your day-to-day -day life. You never know, just like you don't know when you're gonna get in a car accident. There's a lot of things you could use as an example that you just don't know are going to happen when you wake up in the morning. Be ready. 
but being ready has a lot of things. Not like, oh, I carry a gun. Oh, I've been in training. I've shot a lot. I, I know how to shoot a gun. I know how to clean a gun. I know how to use a gun. Uh, so you got to think about these things. You got to visualize it. You got to know what you're going to do. Not just how you're going to react, but then how are you going to react in a lawful manner that doesn't put you behind bars for the rest of your life? So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. And uh, we do have a video. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this. Before we start, Nate, I just I, I want to just encourage people to think about this as well. You know, there's a cliche: the first rule of being in a gunfight is to have a gun, right? And I'm very much in favor of law-abiding, mentally sound Americans who want to carry a gun for personal protection to do that. I think it's your absolute constitutional right. I carry a gun for personal protection. I have my entire adult life. Uh, very comfortable with that for me. My wife does so as well. But having a gun is not the complete answer to the problem. I work a lot of legal cases representing people who've never been in trouble with the law before outside of a speeding ticket who are facing felony aggravated assault charges because they pulled that gun out under inappropriate circumstances. So they had the gun, but that was not enough to solve the problem. You have to have the gun, be able to defend yourself, be able to use that gun effectively, and also know when the law permits you to do that because it doesn't do much for you or your family if you whip that gun out and then you end up spending 20 years in prison or, or tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to stay out of prison. Uh, so like we say at Law of Self-Defense, I'll repeat it at the end. You carry a gun so you're hard to kill, and that's awesome. That's why I carry a gun. You also need to know the law so that you're hard to convict if, heaven forbid, it ever becomes necessary to use that gun. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to put you guys in the somewhat jury seat. Uh, we're going to play this video, and we're going to uh, pull you, and, you, and you're going to make the call. Is this a, a lawful shot? Or an unlawful shot at this moment. So first, we're going to pull up a little quick picture of this scenario. Andrew, you can uh, kind of break this down. Yeah. So this is not a video right here. This is just the the first frame of the first video segment that we'll show you in just a moment. But I thought this first frame was important enough that we ought to treat it separately. Now, some of you may be familiar with this event. This was a armed robbery of a convenience store in Kentucky. Uh, this is the bad guy, obviously coming in wearing a mask. And it happens, it was uh, late at night, about 10 o'clock at night. The place was mostly empty, but there were a uh, husband and wife in the joint sitting in a booth in the back. And it just happens that they're both law enforcement officers who were on a date night. So they're in plain clothes, not representing, uh, not presenting any emblems of being law enforcement, but both armed when this armed robbery goes down just feet from where they're, they're trying to have a little romance for the evening. Uh, now, I'd like to, as we step through these videos, I would like us to do our analysis of the use of force, uh, the self-defense law, from two contexts, both as them as cops, which they actually are in real life, but also from the hypothetical context in which they're not cops. They're just two normal, law-abiding American citizens with concealed carry permits who found themselves in exactly the same situation. Because for some of these elements, the outcome will be exactly the same, whether they're police or not. But for others, it'll be quite different. And it's important to understand the distinction so that unless you're actually a cop, you don't find yourself acting like a cop because that would be inappropriate and perhaps quite unlawful. So the reason I want to show this first image, if we could bring it back up, Nate, uh, this is the first thing we see in this video clip. It's without the red circles. I've added the red circles, but the guy walks in uh, and now it happens to be pretty cold here, 40-ish degrees. So depending on what part of the country you're in, you know, that might qualify as cold or not. Uh, but probably not cold enough to be wearing a full face mask over your face as you're uh, halfway to the counter of a convenience store at 10 o'clock, uh, sorry, a fast food joint at 10 o'clock at night. And he's got his ha right hand buried in his pocket. Uh, let's pretend, we don't know what the audio is, there is no audio in here, but let's pretend he has not yet said anything, not yet made any demands, but he's come in with his right hand buried in his pocket, wearing a full face mask approaching the counter right here, at this moment, if that clerk behind the counter had a gun, would she be legally privileged to draw that gun and shoot this guy in the face using deadly defensive force to stop what appears to be, she may make the reasonable inference, this is a robbery about to go down. So that would actually be the first poll. Right here, she turns around, she sees this dude have the five elements for the use of deadly defensive force been met just seeing him in this condition. So there you go. Let's run that poll. It's going up now. So um, would this be a good shot? Now let's go over this again. Good shot means lawful. Is right. He, is this a lawful shot right now? 
Uh, can he be protected by the laws of the five elements that we're talking about, which hopefully you've printed that out and you know those right now. Um, and we're watching this poll. So go ahead and vote, everybody that's on Facebook. Unfortunately, if you're on YouTube, you're not allowed to vote. This uh, poll is being run right, correct, Riley, on Facebook only? Yep. All right. So go ahead and vote. Let's see what you guys think. Um, and of course, the answer should be based on what those five elements are and whether we have evidence that we can perceive from which we can infer that those five elements have been met. And of course, one of them is the element of innocence. Are you facing an unlawful aggressor? Um, is the mask and the hand in the pocket enough to qualify as that? Imminence is whatever threat you're facing about to immediately happen. It's not some future threat or some past threat. Proportionality, is it a deadly force threat or not a deadly force threat? Um, avoidance, do you have a legal duty to retreat? And is retreat even safely possible? And of course, reasonableness, are you perceiving things as a reasonable person would perceive them or are you perce perceiving them irrationally? Irration an irrational perception of a threat does not count for self-defense law purposes. So, Nate, I see people are saying they're not seeing the poll. I, I actually had the poll. I voted on the poll, so I'm not sure why some people aren't seeing that. And I'm not seeing it. So, um, and We're not getting the results either. But it popped up on my phone, which yeah. is interesting. It, it is Facebook, so. All right. <laughs> 35 people have voted so far. We can see that. Is it only on the phone they can see it? Is that the um, issue? I don't know. Well, here, here's, here's, let's, let's see what's going on here. Uh, it doesn't matter. Here's what I'm going to say right now. According to our comments, most people are saying, no, this is not a lawful shoot is what, uh, I'm seeing for the most part. Um, I don't know. Poll worked for Bryson Campbell. Poll worked for me. Uh, let's see. No poll. Clay Chrisley saw it. Okay, so I'm seeing iPad worked. It looks like maybe some of the mobile devices are working, but the desktop may be an issue. Yeah, anyway, I'll leave the technology stuff up to you guys. If folks want to put their thoughts in the comments as well, you know, why they voted in a particular way, that's always helpful yes. uh, to me. I have a sense of where folks are going. Uh, and what I'm mostly seeing is people saying, probably not, uh, haven't met the conditions yet for deadly defense force, largely because there's not yet clearly a deadly force threat. The guy's not displaying a gun. Uh, or a weapon of some kind, I assume that's what they're referring to. And I would agree, the situation is certainly ambiguous here. Uh, there's not an explicit, clear, absolute deadly force threat from this guy. But remember, an argument can still be made that you're allowed to protect yourself not just from a threat that's actually in progress, but a threat that's imminently about to occur. And if this guy's conduct, the mask, the hand in the pocket, is conduct from which a reasonable person could infer that an armed robbery is going down. He doesn't have his hands in plain sight. There's a reason he's got that hand buried in his pocket. It's probably to make you think he has a weapon, even if he does not. Um, so I think an argument could be made that if this clerk were to at least draw a gun, put her hand on a gun, uh, that she'd be in a pretty defensible position because this guy's representing himself much like an armed robber would represent himself. Now, actually firing the shot, I think it would be more difficult to defend. Keep in mind, however, the prosecution is going to have to disprove any claim of self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. So he's got a high threshold. Now, that's not a legal case I would like to defend. I think she could be, put herself in a better position than simply, uh, plus it might be difficult to get more customers in the future if she simply draws and shoots them in the face. But it's certainly circumstances that would get 150% of my attention if I were behind that counter and this dude walked in wearing a full face mask and his right hand buried in his pocket. So can I be clear on something? I just wanted to get clarification from you, Andrew. So you're saying it's not enough to fire a shot, but it is enough to at least put your hand on your firearm. Did you say even draw your firearm on this person? Maybe. So you'd have to convince whoever was evaluating that use or threat of force that you had a reasonable perception that this person represented an eminent deadly force threat. Uh, hard to do. Harder to do than if you were displaying a gun, for sure. Uh, but I would certainly be ready to display my gun. I would have my hand on my gun. Now, it would be helpful if you can do that, have your hand on your gun or at least very close to your gun without making it apparent that you're doing that. So carry your gun in such a matter, maybe appendix in the waistband where your hands can be, you know, by your waistband, not displaying a gun, but it's an awfully quick way to get the gun out of the holster uh, from that circumstance so that you're prepared to go to deadly force should things go sideways. So speaking of, shall we uh, play the first video here? Sure. And, so the uh, first video starts with that frame and then it continues a few more seconds. 
So let's go ahead and run that. All righty, here we go. So he's walked up to the counter now, uh, and he's making demands. Now, I don't know what he's saying, but let's pretend. Let's imagine. Hypothetically, he's saying, all right, give me all your money, or I'll shoot you in the face. Uh, but he has not yet displayed a weapon, so he just still has his hand in his pocket. Uh, but once he makes the verbal demand, uh, clearly now what we have here is at least a purported armed robbery in progress, right? He's trying to make you think that he's prepared to shoot you in the face and he's got a weapon. Under these circumstances, now he's progressed a few more feet. His his physical actions haven't changed much. He's still got his right hand in his pocket, not displaying a weapon, but he's now made a, we're hypothesizing, we're, we're imagining, he's made this verbal command and threat. Give me your money or I'll shoot you in the face. At this point, would it be a good shoot or a bad shoot for this clerk behind the counter? to simply draw her own gun and shoot this guy in the nose. Right. So the poll's up. So go ahead and vote on that. Hopefully you guys are able to vote. If not, could you put it in the comments? Tell me what you guys think. Explain your uh, reasoning behind it. Also, I did see a comment in here. Uh, I'm not sure if this like helps you guys make a decision, but if he does have a firearm, he can shoot through a sweatshirt. I know that was a comment that was in here. And uh, that woman does not know if it's a firearm or if it's not, but it dang well could be, and he can shoot right through his sweatshirt. Right. So, so, of course, one of the key issues here is there's still a certain degree of ambiguity, right? He hasn't displayed a gun. We don't know if he has a gun. He might not have a gun. He might just have his hand in his pocket pretending to have a gun. So to what extent does that influence whether or not your use or the clerk's use of deadly defensive force would be lawful? And the way the law looks at it is... What the clerk's permitted to do is make reasonable inferences from the evidence available and the combination of a verbal threat to shoot you and conduct that's consistent with having the gun, the means to execute that threat, is sufficient. That's enough to make a reasonable inference that he represents a deadly force threat. Now, it may turn out he doesn't have a gun. It may turn out he was faking the entire time, but the law permits you to treat him as consistent with his claims and his conduct. He's claiming he has the means to shoot you. He's conducting himself as if he has the gun to do that. You're allowed to take him at his word and treat him as if he has the deadly weapon. He's doing everything in his power to convince you that he has. So, good shoot. Covered by the law. Yeah, right? so remember, nothing's absolute, right? It's all degrees of, of gray. But you're you're very deep into the good shoot side of this spectrum here. Right. Uh, somebody comes up to a counter. It's their fingers and they have their hand in their pocket and they say, hey, I've got a gun. Give me all the money. I'm going to shoot you. Even though you can't tell it's his fingers, it could be a gun. So you you're, allowed, you're allowed to treat the reasonably perceived threat. If he'd be reasonably perceived as having a gun in his pocket, that's how you're allowed to treat him. Even if it turns out later he was completely faking. That's not on you. That's on right. him. So now you can use deadly force against that person correct right well now he's presenting an imminent deadly force threat against an innocent person we've checked off those five boxes now that raises the issue you can you've checked off all the legal requirements for the use of deadly defensive force is that the smart thing to do well that's not a legal question now that's a tactical question or a practical question uh, might it be a better option certainly this clerk's corporate bosses are going to tell her we don't want you shooting anybody uh, armed robbers or customers uh, we want you to simply comply with the robber's uh, demands, give them whatever money is in the register, and don't get involved in a physical confrontation. That's not an unreasonable approach. Maybe it's the better approach. Only the person in the spot can make that call at that moment. But it's not a legally required approach. If she were to decide to use deadly defensive force in defense of herself or others innocents in the vicinity, the law would allow her to do that. She might well lose her job. Company policy might not allow it. Uh, but the law allows it from a criminal law perspective. There you go. Well, uh, I think we're going to continue on with this video and uh, see where this thing goes. So let's play the so next piece. The next clip is about the same, but it proceeds a few more seconds, so it gives us more information. Uh, we'll see the bad guy walk up to the counter, make his demands. We're hypothesizing verbal demands. And there's the gun. He's flashed the gun. Uh, now he's shoving the gun back in his waistband. Uh, I guess he doesn't have a good alien gear holster to work with. Um, and But now we're fully aware that he has a gun, right? He's demonstrated an ability to carry out his uh, verbal threat to shoot the clerk, to threaten her with deadly force if she does not comply with his demands. 
uh, to uh, accede to the robbery and give him the money. We see a gun now. So under this circumstances, we've progressed. We have more information. It's not just speculative whether or not he might have a gun in his pocket. Now we know he has a gun in his pocket. Uh, so the question here would be, now that the clerk has this information, would that clerk or a customer observing from behind him, waiting for his food to be ready, for example, who has a concealed carry permit, who sees what's happening, has all the information the clerk has, either of them, would it be lawful for them to use deadly defensive force at this stage of the proceedings? There's the poll. Is it? Uh, is that running? I, I know we're having some issues with the poll, guys. So if you guys can, can we can we put it in comments? Put your guys' answer in comments. I, some people are seeing the poll, some people aren't. So let's just let's just go with the comments today. Is this a good shot? And explain it if you want. You can say uh, what would you do in in this situation. Let's say like uh, Andrew said, you're behind this, you know, waiting for them to call your order, and you see this go down. You're carrying a firearm, and you heard it. And now you've seen the gun. Not only is the waitress or the lady behind the counter, is she going to be able to shoot this guy? Can you shoot this guy? That's the question. Good shot, meaning lawful, or a bad shot, meaning no, you can't shoot this guy. Yes, yeah, so I see a couple of issues come up in the comments that I'd like to address. One is, well, what if the bad guy doesn't have a gun? What if he has a knife? Uh, does that change the circumstances? Well, the fundamental legal question is the same. Does the knife now represent an eminent deadly force threat? In other words, can he bring the knife to bear to cause deadly injury? Um, you know, you can bring a knife to bear from quite some distance away, a quick step and a three foot reach, and you've crossed four or five feet of distance with that knife. And then however long the knife is, um, and you don't need a big knife to cause a lot of injury. I worked a case recently where a guy was killed with a, a little two and a half inch blade knife. It just happened to clip his heart in just the right spot, and that was all she wrote. Uh, now, what's different here is, of course, there is an obstacle. There is a counter. So theoretically, the clerk might be able to take a step back, two steps back, and no longer be within the immediate reach of the guy with the knife. So you can neutralize the effective reach of an impact weapon by creating distance from the impact weapon. You can't do that with a gun, obviously. The bullet doesn't care if there's a counter there or not. It crosses the, the distance just as quickly. So if what he has is a knife. Yes, then it raises a different question about whether or not it's still possible for him to bring the knife to bear. And even if she takes two steps back and it's not possible to bring the knife to bear, then the question is, well, what if he leaps over the counter? Then the counter is not an obstacle anymore, right? Then circumstances have changed again. And perhaps now he does once more have the ability to bring the knife to bear. But the changing from a projectile weapon like a firearm to an impact weapon like a knife or a club or a bat or a fist does change that that dynamic now we have to ask the question of whether they're close enough and clear enough of obstacles to actually bring that impact weapon to bear uh there was another question as well about uh let's see if i can remember what it was i've, I've got something here too and uh sure go ahead throw it and maybe i'll remember as i'm yeah thinking. so uh i don't know if you're following on youtube but somebody mentioned on youtube um that this is only property he's asking for money so you can't shoot this man so let's, ex okay, let's that would be, explain that. Sure. So that would be an error. So there are crimes against persons, there's crimes against property, and then there's crimes that involve threat to property and persons simultaneously. So if there were a bag of money in the corner of this restaurant, uh, say the day's receipts were in a bank bag, and uh, someone uh, was going out the door, they said, oh my gosh, I forgot my cigarettes, and they leave the bag on a chair by the door, and they go back in the store to get their cigarettes, and someone snatches the bag. That can happen without there being any threat to persons, and that would purely be a property crime against which deadly force would not be appropriate outside of the state of Texas, of course, uh, which is a whole complicated scenario by itself. But there we have a pure property offense against which deadly defensive force would not normally be an issue. Then we have simple assaults and batteries in which there's no property offense involved at all. It's simply a threat to persons. But of course, there are crimes that involve both, and an armed robbery involves both. There's a demand for money, the unlawful taking of money, that's a property offense, but it's being executed by threatening the person. So there is a threat to persons in a robbery scenario. That's the definition of robbery. It's the taking of property by threat of force to another person. Uh, and when we have both the threat to property and threat to persons, it's the threat to persons that dominates the analysis and it's a self-defense and not a defensive property situation. 
There you go. Your uh, life other, is uh, on the line. Essentially, your right. life is at risk. So you're not looking at someone for the feel gun. something at a distance. Right, right, right. He's asking for money, but he could shoot you at any second. And all it takes is this for your life to be over with. Right. He's really. threatening you with death. That's yeah. why yeah. how he's trying to get you to comply with the property demand. Right. Uh, the so other issue, case, I remember what it was. Could face death. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, he's threatening you with imminent death. I mean, that's the purpose of the gun is to put you in fear of your life. Or Otherwise, he'd just walk in empty-handed and say, give me some money. Right. right? But that's not what he's doing. Um, the other question had to do with retreat. And, of course, avoidance is one of those five elements. Avoidance has to do with whether or not there's a legal duty to retreat, if safely possible, before you can use force and self-defense. Only about 13 states impose a legal duty to retreat. Most states don't do that. Uh, this is in Kentucky, so there would be no generalized legal duty to retreat. Um, even uh, in many states that do impose it, they, one of the exceptions is always the castle doctrine for your home, which sometimes also covers a place of business. For the clerk, this would be her place of business. Uh, but of course, even if uh, a duty to retreat was being applied here, it's only applied if it's safely possible. If you can retreat and be completely safe from the threat then. But if you're being threatened at a distance of two or three feet with a handgun, there's no way you're retreating fast enough to avoid the threat of the bullet. That's not happening. There is no safe avenue of retreat, so retreat would not be required under any circumstances. Now, what if the guy had a knife? Well, possibly, if you were in a duty to retreat state, they'd say, well, you know, if you took a couple steps back, you'd be out of reach of the knife, and therefore you'd be completely safe from the knife. Perhaps there would be a viable argument that you'd have the legal duty to retreat, and violation of that legal duty would cost you self-defense. At the same time, it's important to keep in mind that you're not required to retreat and leave other innocent people behind. So if there were other customers in the store, other people within reach of this dude, um, you're not required to retreat as a legal obligation so he can stab or shoot other people who are left behind. So I'm seeing a lot of comments here, um, and I want to make it clear. We're talking about self-defense laws, right? So defending yourself, uh, not about gun laws or uh, no carry zones, certain things like that. Uh, I know I know there's a, a couple of things that are being brought up here and um, you know those are gonna be two different things so if, if this business says uh, no guns allowed and you bring a gun in and then you witness this and you shoot the guy uh, those are gonna be different things this you're gonna deal with self-defense and then you're gonna deal with you know breaking the law right the two sign, completely different circumstances. so uh, I don't I don't do gun law per se my expertise is the use of force law but I will tell people that as you say these are two different buckets so it's quite possible to use force completely lawfully and then still find yourself in violation of some weapons law so for example if you were in a gun control state like New York State and you had a gun on you but unlawfully you might act in self-defense and your use of force could be perfectly legitimate self-defense you're not charged with any offense to person's crime. No aggravated assault, no murder, no manslaughter. But you're still looking at jail time because you unlawfully possess that gun. So you're clear of a offense to person's crime, but you're stuck on the weapons crime. Uh, same thing could happen in a place where if you're carrying, you normally have a concealed carry license, so you're normally lawful. But you're in a state where uh, if a business is posted, that has criminal effect. Well, you might defend yourself lawfully in that business. Good shoot but still be liable for the weapons law violation. Uh, before we continue on, I want to cover one more thing, Amy, um, real quick. So uh, she had a question about, let's say you're on the side of the counter with this man and you see something that the, the woman behind the counter doesn't see, like you see his firearm. You know, at that point, uh, all the laws are the same. All the elements are the same. So if you see something that makes it okay, you check all the boxes, then yes you can use deadly force to save her life. You're uh, right, you're operating independently of any other person there. So each person is making their own decision based on the evidence that they're seeing. And it's not uncommon for people to see different things and therefore to come to different conclusions. Uh, it's not uncommon, particularly normally when it's multiple good guys with guns, it's a police situation where multiple cops have arrived due to a 911 call and some of them shoot and some of them don't shoot. It doesn't mean the guys who shot made the wrong decision. It doesn't mean the guys who didn't shoot made the wrong decision. They were basing their decisions on different pools of information. Uh, so each of us is making the decisions based on the information available to us and will be judged accordingly based on the information available to us. We're not expected to magically know what someone else knew. Uh, we're only judged on the information that we had and the reasonable inferences we made from the information we had. 
Hey, Riley, let's roll this next video here, and uh, we're going to continue on and see what happens here. So here we go. So the guy comes up to the counter. He's making his demands. We'll see him flash the gun. Hey, I got a gun. Yeah, everybody's got a gun. So uh, then we have new participants. Here's that couple in the back of the store on their date night. Um, now, this happens to be a husband and wife who are both police officers. They're off duty. They're just getting together and having some junk food at the fast food joint. Um, and they see an armed robbery go down. So I'd like to address this both from the perspective of them as law enforcement officers and let's assume the hypothetical where they were not law enforcement officers. They were just two law abiding people with concealed carry permits who see an armed robbery go down. Um, for the cop situation, it's pretty clear the cops can intervene to stop an armed robbery. So let's focus here on, with the polling question on if these are not cops. This is just Tom and Mary, your neighbors down the street have concealed carry permits, not law enforcement officers, never have been. Uh, the, you can see the guy's getting up right here, immediately presenting his handgun to engage this armed robber. As a non-law enforcement officer, if he were to fire the shot right there, no verbal challenge, nothing said, maybe the armed robber never even saw him coming. Could he just stand up from his booth, present his gun, and simply shoot this guy from across the room and kill him and have that be a lawful use of deadly defensive force? Let's put it in comments, folks. I think some of you already know the answer. Some people are already uh, putting them in there. But um, Brennan, Riley, you guys got input on this? Or you want me to just take this one? You got this, Brennan? Go ahead. Um, okay, Andrew, here's my take on this. The guy's going to have six rounds to the chest probably pretty quick. I'm going to shoot right here. Draw it. Right. So, done. Yeah, from the uh, – from the of course, the legal perspective, which is where I'm coming from, the question is, have those five elements of self-defense been checked off? Innocence, do we have an unlawful aggressor here? Yes, we do. Is he presenting an imminent threat to some innocent person in the vicinity? It doesn't have to be you. Here, it's the clerk, right? Not the people in the booth. That's fine. He's presenting an imminent threat. Is it a deadly force threat? Yes, he's presenting a gun. Um, is it? Uh, are there issues of avoidance here? Well, even if there were issues of avoidance, you're not required to retreat and leave the clerk behind. So that wouldn't apply. And of course, for police officers, it simply doesn't apply. Their job is to intervene and stop criminal conduct. And reasonable here, they're, they're perceiving the events reasonably. It's an armed robbery going down, and there's no other way to perceive the events. So all the checkboxes have been checked. And by the way, folks, I, I meant to touch upon this earlier, but what if he engages this guy and uses deadly defensive force, shoots him dead, shoots him right through the head, right there, drops him. Um, and it turns out that the bad guy's gun is not a real gun. It's a toy gun. It's a fake gun. Plastic. Couldn't potentially, couldn't possibly hurt anybody. Uh, not even if you hit him over the head with it, it wouldn't hurt him because it's made out of rubber. Does that change any of the legal analysis? And the answer is, it does not change any of the legal analysis so long as a reasonable person would have perceived that fake gun as a real gun. If it looks like a real gun, you're entitled to treat it as if it were a real gun. Um, you're not required to try to do a field strip of the gun and determine whether or not it's real. It's being presented as a real weapon. It looks like a real weapon. You're allowed to treat it as a real weapon. If it turns out later it's a toy, uh, well, that's unfortunate for the armed robber, but that's on him. That's not on anybody else. And by the way, you'd be shocked at how many people are shot by police because they pointed a fake gun at the police. Happens all the time, folks. I don't know why people do it, but they do it. It's still a good shoot. So long as the gun looks, would be perceived reasonably as a real gun. So this is controversy right here, okay? Here we go, Andrew. There's a couple things. There's people got a lot to talk about this video right here. Now, these guys are law enforcement this man and woman but we're talking about them as not being law enforcement right now right. so let's make that clear but a lot of people think that this is a bad shot but you got to remember they have seen his firearm they have seen someone's life be threatened they can as not even not even being law enforcement they can shoot this man dead and still be protected by the law can they not yes all the conditions for the use of deadly defensive force have been met now that's from a legal perspective. I think reasonable people can disagree on whether or not tactically that would be the right decision to make. I mean, they have other options, right? They could simply stay in their booth. They could right. try to escape out the back of the restaurant. 
And I wouldn't criticize anybody for making those other choices. Right. Absolutely. But none of those other choices has anything to do with the fact that they would be legally entitled to use deadly force if that's the decision they made. Yeah, so Andrew, I would somebody saying... To make sure if you're thinking of doing this, make sure you can make that shot. That's not an easy shot. Yeah, and um, uh, you're probably going to have return fire because unless you sever the spinal column and, and paralyze them instantly or hit that brain, that little piece of the brain that stops motor function, it's probably going to return fire. Most That's why I wouldn't will. criticize people who did not want to engage. If you engage, what are you doing? You're literally choosing to get into a gunfight. Well, yeah. people who get into gunfights die, right? Some yeah. of them die. That could be you. There's no magic pixie dust that says only the bad guy gets shot. Uh, so you're yeah. taking that risk if you decide to intervene. Um, so, Andrew, somebody said in comments that but they, those people weren't threatened. Their lives weren't threatened, so they shouldn't be able to shoot. Right. So strictly speaking, until they're threatened, it's not a self-defense scenario, but it's a defense of others scenario. And you're entitled to use as much force in defense of another person as that other person would be entitled to use in their own defense. There you go. Don't you guys love this show? I mean, you just learn so much. And I, and I love it. And somebody made a comment saying, I love how engaged people are and how people are really thinking about these things. And I do too. I love it. I love that this is kind of like this people questioning and going back and forth about why and they feel this certain way. But that's the thing is you can't just think you know. You have to actually know. And that's one of the other things I love is you, about the show is you get to know the actual truth, the laws. Where, you know, we talk about this a lot, Andrew. And this has happened to me in the past. You know, I thought I knew. And I get into a debate with a buddy of mine and say, no, it's this, blah, blah, blah. And yeah. only, he's like, how do you know? And I go, well, the trainer told me at the firearms academy thing, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, well, let me tell you something. <laughs> you know wrong, yeah. you know. And uh, so you're misinformed. But that's why it's so awesome to have you here, Andrew. And I know we've got more videos to go to. I'm not trying to go away at sure. any time soon. But I'm just saying it's so awesome. And I know people love it. And uh and this is just valuable stuff. This is, these are the things you need to know. There's a lot of things when you carry a firearm that I believe are an obligation. One, you need to be able to train. You need to be able to be effective. Two, you need to know the law. And I mean, you don't need to, but I highly suggest it. Because like Andrew always says, do you want to spend the rest of your life behind bars because you're trying to protect your loved ones that you probably won't ever see? Even if you make it out alive, the people you're protecting, you may never see unless you have a barrier between you probably because you didn't check one of the five boxes and that's why that thing is the five elements are so important for you guys to know as well let's 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 that's why it's free too andrew's giving that to you all for free because we want to be here for each other it's our community right and and uh we're supporting each other and this is this is exactly why we do these shows because uh, a lot of people i think we all assume that we know what the law is but here's the facts and yeah, I mean, in, in my experience, uh, you know, people in the gun community tend to know a lot about self-defense law. Unfortunately, much of what they know is wrong <laughs> because they were poorly taught by people themselves who don't have a good education on what self-defense law actually is. And people just repeat things they read in gun magazines or they see on the Internet or their their buddy, the retired cop down the street tells them. And by the way, folks, I don't care who you are. Uh, you could be a cop or you could be a lawyer. As far as I'm concerned, that's no automatic stamp that you know this stuff because I know plenty of cops and lawyers who don't know this stuff at all who were poorly taught themselves. The only thing that matters at the end of the day is not what someone taught you or what you think might be the law. It matters what the law actually is. The statutes, the jury instructions, the court decisions, period. If you're in court, that's all that matters. You coming in and say, hey, I read on this gun forum that I'm allowed to do X, Y, and Z. Nobody's going to care about that, folks. They'll laugh you out of court and throw your butt in jail. Um, one of the most common things I hear in cases I work with, and most of the cases I work with, again, are law-abiding people, never been in trouble with the law a day in their lives, now facing 10, 20-year felony charges, looking to prison for a decade or two. And they tell me, I can't believe I'm getting prosecuted for self-defense because in their minds, they genuinely believe they acted in lawful self-defense. They have no idea that those five elements, those conditions apply, and they violated one or more of them and made themselves vulnerable to easy conviction by a prosecutor. Not out of malice. They didn't act out of malice. They thought they were acting lawfully. They just didn't know. And ignorance will lock you up. Hmm, there you go. Ignorance will lock you up. So let's avoid that. You get a free book. The free book, The Law of Self-Defense. It's free. 
for you right now. All you have to do is pay the shipping and handling. Go to lawofselfdefense.com slash CTS book. It's free. Then it's on you to take the time to read it so you know. And then go back and reread it. And you probably want to go back and reread it again just to familiarize yourself with all these. Okay, we've got a couple more videos. I know we're going a little longer than we normally do here, but we've got a couple more videos. Let's let's continue to play this scenario out. Okay, so it proceeds again. Here's the guy making his demands. He'll flash the gun. We'll see the couple in the counter stand up, uh, and it'll progress a few more seconds. So here's the dude. He gets up. The woman seems to be checking the tip or something, but she joins him eventually. Uh, they split up. Very nice tactical move here, and now the video loops again. So they've divided. They've separated. They've not lined themselves up, right? So this bad guy wants to shoot at them. He has two different targets he has to engage to neutralize the threat against them. Very sound tactics. This, of course, reflects almost certainly the fact that they're law enforcement officers, although well-trained civilians will know to do this as well, uh, for sure, if they've taken any kind of uh, private civilian tactical type of training. The question here now, and you can see the guy's mouth moving, so he is giving verbal demands. Folks, verbal demands are not required, okay? Now, they may be required of your police officer. They may be required by your departmental policies. And if you violate those policies, you could lose your job. But they're not a legal requirement under criminal law to determine whether or not your use of force is a crime or not. No requirement to give verbal commands. Uh, he appears to be giving verbal commands here. The real question I wanted to present for all of you is now they're separated. The man and the woman are separated. They each have a lane of fire on this guy. They could each engage this guy with fire. If they both do that simultaneously, is that a good shoot or is it a bad shoot? Is it a lawful use of deadly defensive force or would it be a disproportional use of force because they have two guns and he's only got one gun? So that's the question. Would both of them engaging simultaneously, would that be a good shoot or a bad shoot from a legal perspective? There you go. Put it in comments. Let's hear from you. Um, Andrew, I'm thinking that it doesn't matter. But, but that's me thinking, right? That's me not knowing 100% sure. But, I mean, if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm with my wife and there's something going down, she's drawing her fire, I'm, I'm drawing mine, and we're both going to – put an end to the threat immediately uh in protecting someone else or our kids whatever so i i feel like i don't we're both gonna be shooting and i'm not gonna depend yeah. on her hitting i'm gonna be hitting she's probably gonna be hitting too and there might be another guy and we might be in a church and there's yeah. six people shooting the same dude. that's right that's right we used that we saw that video recently um and that's absolutely the case so each individual is responding to the threat as an individual for each of them the five conditions for the lawful use of force have to be met for the use of defensive force to be lawful. But if they are met, that use of force is lawful independent of what anybody else is doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so it doesn't matter who else is shooting or not shooting. It only matters what their circumstances are. And if that ends up like those Glock commercials, right? No, I guess you walked into the wrong apartment or work. If that ends up with 30 people engaged in the bad guy, that's too bad for the bad guy as long as each of those 30 people had those five elements checked off for, to justify the lawfulness of their use of force. Yeah, and here's something else I want to point out. This couple right here, let's just say they're not law enforcement. They had a plan, they, or they at least seem like they know what they're doing. And uh, I, I would highly suggest that you already that you talk about it with your family. And like my wife knows, if something goes down, she and I say like get down or move, take cover, whatever it is, she knows that she's gonna do what she needs to do and I'm gonna do what I need to do and we're both, uh, we're not gonna question, what, what's going on? Uh, you, gotta ha you gotta have these conversations. It's like, you don't just make a plan when your house is on fire, how you're gonna get out of your house, right? You know an escaper, you know what you're gonna do. These things need to be discussed too and, and obviously they are officers so they already know, but uh, you don't just stand right next to each other, right? What, what do you guys do? You know, if, if that was my wife and we were with my kids, she would have probably had him in that going, I think it's a bathroom door or whatever it is and going for cover. You know, we, we just, we just already know that we are. Yep. And that's what I'm suggesting is just have a plan because you don't know when this is going to go on. Right. So there's a lot of things being a gun owner carrying every day that you have to do. You don't just grab a gun and put it in your waistband and walk around with a loaded gun. You know, there's other things to think about too. So. And we always tell people at Law of Self-Defense to use these events, use these videos, use news mm -hmm. stories 
And the news almost always gets all this wrong, folks. I've never seen them get it right yet in, in 25 years of doing this. But it doesn't matter. Just pretend they got it right and use it as a training exercise. If any of you are pilots, you know that pilots study crashes of other pilots to learn from those mistakes, to learn lessons. So when you read about events like this, ask yourself, all right, where are the five elements that we'd need to be present? Is innocence there? Is imminence there? Step through all of them. Which of those elements are strong? Which are weak? What could this person have done differently to better position themselves to win both the physical fight and the legal fight using it as that kind of training exercise? So if you ever find yourself in a similar situation, it's literally not the first time your brain is processing that scenario. It's done it before. Yep. So it's gotten some exposure to what the kind of general uh, physical and legal parameters are that you'll have to deal with. Folks, I'm sorry. I know this show is going a little bit longer. We still got a couple of videos. We're going we're gonna to conclude these videos here real soon. Uh, I'm super excited that you guys are still here. Thank you all for being here still. Uh, I mean, I could talk about this all day. So I won't keep you much longer, but we do have a couple more of these videos. Let's see how this turns out. Let's go. Let's see it, Riley. Okay, so now they're out of their booth. They're closing with this guy and they're approaching and the guy realizes oh my gosh there's uh, other people with guns here he runs out the door and uh, it's hard to see but that little red circle at the end there before the video loops that's the bad guy dropping his gun he dropped his gun going out the door so now they're still pursuing him imagine at this moment he's in the doorway he's running out he's dropped his gun if they shot him there in the back, would that be a good shoot from a legal perspective? There you go. Put it in comments. He's running away. He hits the door. I don't know if the way he hits it, knocks it out of his hand, but he's not waiting anymore because he thinks he's about to get bullets to the back. As he's leaving, he's in the doorway, running away. Can they shoot him? And now these are not police officers. They're not off-duty police officers. These are just regular people having dinner. Is it a good shot? Um, if we're if we're looking at regular, average Joe citizens, Andrew, I'm saying you better not pull that trigger. Yeah, so it really actually doesn't matter much whether or not they're law enforcement or not. Uh, the real question here is whether or not they're aware that he no longer has the gun, that he's dropped the gun, because they might not be aware, right? They might they have their own guns up. They're not seeing much below their gun, right? The gun blocks a lot of vision looking downwards. It's quite possible that this guy could have dropped his gun and they don't know he's dropped his gun. If they believe he still has his gun, he's still a deadly force threat. He could easily fire a shot back over his shoulder, just reaching back. He's a threat to other people in the immediate vicinity. So I think a good argument could be made if you genuinely don't know that he dropped the gun, that you're still inferring that he's got the deadly weapon. He's still a deadly force threat. If you know he's dropped the gun, then things are different. Now, this is a subjective state of knowledge. If you know he's dropped the gun, well, then the deadly force weapon you are aware of is no longer in his possession. He's no longer a deadly force threat. The question is, well, how do you know he doesn't have a second gun or a third gun or fourth gun or eight guns or whatever the case might be? And the answer is, of course, you don't. But that's the key. You don't. You don't actually know. And you're not allowed to use deadly defensive force against another based on speculation that they might still represent an eminent deadly force threat. Unless you have some evidence from which you could infer a second gun, maybe you saw a second gun in his waistband, he threatened he had a second gun, he's somebody known to you who habitually carries two guns, but there has to be something other than pure speculation or imagination that he might have a second gun before you'd be permitted to treat him as if that were true. So, Andrew, I, I need you to clear something up for me. This guy, let's just say he has the gun in his hand. He doesn't drop it. And he's running for his life, slams open the doors. He's he's gone. Like, he's booking it, right? I know he could turn over his shoulder and shoot through the window, but he's not really an imminent threat anymore still, is he? I mean, really? I, he's, I think he's, you can make a very strong argument that he still is. I've seen plenty of video with bad guys just reaching over their shoulder with their gun, firing bullets back at the police chasing them. It happens all the time. So as long as he's got the gun, he's still an eminent deadly force threat, especially considering he's just been threatening people to do it. Uh, criminals shoot people to escape getting arrested all the time. Um, so might, might you decide that prudence is the better part of valor and you're not going to chase a guy who's running away with a gun? I think that would be a perfectly reasonable decision. But had you shot him and he still had the gun in his possession, I think you'd have a very robust use of force justification. 
That changes, of course, if you know he no longer has the gun, right? So if the cops show up afterwards and say, hey, tell us what happened, and you say, well, he dropped the gun going out the door, and I knew I had him now because I could shoot him and he couldn't shoot yeah. me back, that's going to be a pretty <laughs> awkward situation because you've just told everyone that you were well aware he was no longer mm -hmm. a deadly force threat. And the same would apply to police, by the way. If they know he's dropped the gun, they, they may be chasing him down the street trying to make an arrest, and that's perfectly legitimate, but they can't be shooting him in the back if there's no reason to believe he's still a deadly force threat to other people. Right. Um, is there one more? One more little last one. And let's this see. one is where whether or not they're cops makes a huge difference. All right, up to now, see. it really hasn't. All right, so they get up. They're presenting their guns. They're probably screaming, drop drop your gun, drop your gun, drop your gun. He realizes he's uh, one gun to two guns. He runs out the door, drops his pistol, and he runs out the door. And guess what? They run out the door after him. Uh, well, this is where them being law enforcement or not law enforcement makes a big difference. Now, this is not a good shoot, bad shoot scenario, so we wouldn't really need the poll anyway because uh, assuming they know he's dropped the gun and they do kind of run right past it, uh, it wouldn't be justified for even police officers to shoot him in the back as he's running away, given that he's no longer a deadly force threat to anybody. Uh, but they, police officers are certainly entitled to chase him and make the arrest. They just saw him attempt an armed robbery. They have probable cause to make that arrest on a felony charge. If they're not police officers, chasing that guy down the street is a really, really bad idea. Uh, now, someone's going to ask me about citizen's arrest. Folks, please forget all about citizen's arrest, right? Don't be being a cop if you're not a cop. If you want to be a police officer, I give you full credit. Go to the academy, get sworn, get a badge, be a police officer. But unless you've done those things, do not be engaging in citizen's arrest. And if you're chasing the guy down the street now, an argument can be made that, sure, he might have been the initial wrongdoer before in the robbery, but the robbery's over. And now you're actually the initial aggressor in a second fight chasing this unarmed person down the street, pointing a gun at him. Uh, that could be a very awkward situation. Now, I doubt it would be an awkward situation in Kentucky where this happened, but I can assure you there are states in this country like California, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, where they will be very interested in making that a very difficult circumstance for a lawful gun owner chasing someone down the street and waving a pistol around in the air. Yeah. Well, not only that, uh, like you said, you don't know who started this. All you're seeing is a unarmed person running down the street and people chasing after him with guns. Uh, you might, By the way, uh, it's, very, it's very common, too, for armed robbers, even if they appear to be acting alone, to not be acting alone. There could be a getaway driver right at the curb who's got his own gun. And now you come charging at the door and they light you up to protect their buddy. Uh, that's not a position you want to be in. Cops kind of assume that kind of risk because they took on that job voluntarily. You did not. Distance is your best friend. I say it all the time. I'm going to say it forever. Distance is your best friend. You want to create distance. That's all I got. There you go. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry. I know we went a little long. Uh, I think it's worth it. I know a lot of people uh, here are appreciative of it. I certainly I can am. always talk less. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. It's perfectly fine. You know, you do what you do. And I think it was great. I think it, I think it was a great show. And uh, obviously other people agree with me. So, um, Andrew, thank you for your time, your expertise. We certainly appreciate you coming and hanging out with us here at Alien Gear every week. Uh, I don't know what we got to do to say thank you enough. I know all of our Alien Gear family appreciates it too. So uh, I look forward to next week. I always look forward to it. Um, again, ladies and gentlemen, please go get the book. It's free. $8.95 for shipping is all you're going to pay. And uh, that is lawofselfdefense.com slash ctsbook. And then also you should be downloading the five elements of self-defense law. That's free as well. LawSelfDefense.com CTS elements. And then you can follow that along in the book. You can follow that along here on our show. You can memorize it, whatever you got to do to know. And uh, tune in next week because we're going to be doing the same thing. So, uh, Andrew, I'll let you do your clothes off here and say goodbye to everybody. Yes, folks, thank you all for joining us. Thanks for your patience. I really appreciate it. Uh, please learn this stuff. It's not rocket science, but if you don't know it, you're lining yourself up to go to prison, and there's absolutely no need for that to happen. Be informed, and you can make yourself very difficult to convict. As we say at Law of Self-Defense, you carry a gun so you're hard to kill. Know the law so you're hard to convict. There you go. Please tune in tomorrow. We have the raffle. It is uh, You actually can win the state-specific DVD in our raffle 
tomorrow from the Law of Self Defense, which is also available. You can also save 10% at the Law of Self Defense by using the promo code AGHLOSD. Also sign up for the DP-12 shotgun and uh, all the other cool stuff that come along with that shotgun. You get a red dot sight, a tactical flashlight, uh, core, core carry pack, drop lake, a bug out bag, a lot of cool stuff. Uh, so you might want to get signed up for that as well. You're also going to be able to save about 25% tax season deals are going on right now at AlienGearHolsters.com. You can click on the link in this live description right here in Facebook or on YouTube. That'll take you to our website. Please use that link when you're uh, going to make some purchases and you will uh, see all the sales that you can get. It's, I think it's there's probably like 15 products that are on sale, different items uh, from the uh, expansion packs, the shape shift shells, shape shift shells, the a couple of different cloak style too, but they're all on the website. Go check it out right now. Those are only gonna be up for another 33 days, I believe, or something like that. So uh, spend your tax return wisely. That's it this week for calling the shots. Again, we'll be back here tomorrow for uh, the raffle. And uh, we appreciate y'all tuning in. So uh, from all of us here at Alien Gear, please carry safe, carry in comfort, and carry on.